Kia ora and welcome to another Revisioning Skill Camps case study produced by Education Outdoors New Zealand. My name is Sophie Watson and today it's my pleasure to bring you another fantastic case study that reminds us that camp learning doesn't have to be isolated to camp itself. The Revisioning School Camps professional development has run over the past year with support from the Network of Expertise funding. This PLD supports teachers and schools to develop localised, place responsive and student centred school camp programs. We hope by sharing these case studies you'll come away feeling inspired to revision your own school camp experiences or try out a few of the awesome ideas shared by our case study schools. If you would like further information about the Revisioning School Camps PLD or access to more case studies and resources, please visit the Education Outdoors New Zealand website. Thanks for tuning in and we hope you enjoy today's case study. Located just out of Wellington, Churton Park School is home to almost 400 Year 1 to 6 students. Leanne Stubbing, a Year 6 teacher, is the creator behind the school's innovative Year 6 camp and pre-camp program. In this case study, we offer you something a little different. Today we're talking about how a gamified pre-camp program has enabled Leanne's students to deepen their learning and fully prepare them for their camp experience. Leanne begins by giving us an idea of what the previous camp program was like and why changes needed to be made. When I first started at my school, there was already an existing program in place that sort of followed um, some kind of cut and paste type activities. So each kid had on their stationary list for the beginning of the year, a, a book for camp. And there would be some activities that they did beforehand that were, um, you know, sticking the timetable in and kind of quite what I would see as kind of just menial preparatory kind of tasks. So nothing specific around preparing mentally for camp or physically for camp, but just sort of um, having everything ready. And then they took that book with them to camp and they did like journal entries uh, at the end of each day. One of the one of the good activities though that we did do beforehand was the the jelly bean tree, uh, which is the tree where there's different jelly babies sitting on it, and you sort of identify where you're feeling uh, before camp. So that was always a really good activity to do to see where kids were. Were they the kids at the top of the tree ready to jump out, or were they the kids like really close to the bottom holding on for dear life because they were really worried and anxious about camp? So that was kind of our pre-program. It wasn't anything that I particularly enjoyed as a teacher. I wasn't teaching, I was just kind of delivering some, some worksheet type things to stick in a book. And so then thinking about the actual camp itself, you know, what were the kind of outcomes for that camp? Because from what you've just said, it sounds like that the pre-camp stuff was kind of like the obligatory pre-camp activities and then camp happened. And I'm quite interested to know is there any kind of relationship between those two phases and then what were the outcomes that you were looking for during camp? So the camp that we were attending, the, the idea behind it was with these students who are year six is to give them a chance to really take some risks. And we've got like a sort of a, a mantra, sort of like no regrets. So try everything, be pushed outside your comfort zone, give everything a go, um, be in a situation where you're not at home that kind of was the basis of what camp was about. I didn't feel that there was a connection between what we did before camp and what we did during camp, except that the kids knew that there were certain activities that would happen. So they were kind of pre-prepared with what was going to happen, what time it was going to happen and so forth. When we were at the camp, it was quite a busy time as a teacher because we were taking all the activities and we were also providing time filling things so by the time they woke up in the morning to the time they went to bed it was go 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 the kids still got homesick even though we were doing these busy kind of time fillers that, that still wasn't meeting that need the kids weren't prepared for being away from home got back from camp we kind of were doing again some kind of pre-prepared activities that had had been used for a number of years around camp reflections some literacy activities, you know, my time at camp, <laughs> rather than it all linking together. So that was kind of like where it was and why it probably really needed to change. For Leanne, it was critical that the revisioning process started by looking at the camp purpose and considering how and when students were supported to maximise this learning opportunity. 
I think it's about changing the purpose of why you're going on the camp. Like if, if you know if you know what the reason is, then all the other stuff should fall into place. If you just focus narrowly on, oh, we're getting the kids to go away from their parents for one night or two nights or whatever, then you're actually kind of, it's too narrow a focus. So I think, yeah, thinking about what's the purpose of the camp and not seeing it as before, middle and after, maybe seeing it as a whole, you know, big picture. What is it that we're trying to achieve from this? And so then thinking about um, what was the kind of the Kickstarter for you and deciding that actually we need to make some changes here and, and what kind of inspired you start that process, but also what inspired you in the direction that you went? A few years before this camp that I went on, I actually had taken part in a game storming workshop at Ulearn and got really interested in, and excited about using game design with kids. And I had tried it out with my year three, four class straight after that, that workshop and had had a lot of success um, through using the process. And it was the process rather than the outcome because most of the time the games don't work. But the process of making the game, there was mm. so much learning happening in that. Um, and then flip forward a few years later and we're having our first ever uh, sort of games um, conference here in Wellington which I was really lucky to be part of and present at and and I guess when I was there I was immersed in this this culture of like using games for education using them in different ways thinking about what, like being playful and excited about learning and it was actually that all that thinking that was going on while I was attending these workshops and all kind of accumulated and I, one day I just went what if camp was a game and it did it took me a while to work out what that would even look like but I just started with that wondering um and so then talk me through what ended up taking shape and the glazers as part of that implementation process well it was quite timely because we also decided to change which camp we were going to mm -hmm. So I thought this camp's going to be new for me as well as these kids and what would I need to prepare myself for something new that I'd never seen before. So we, with my uh, fellow teachers, we sort of talked about some of the, I, I gave them obviously my idea about camp being a game and um, the idea was to like put in a role playing type situation that then the kids could hopefully transfer the skills that they learned through designing the role play game and then use those things when they were in a real life situation. And that was the discussion, like what, what sort of activities could we do that would help with that and using the, the game design process that I was familiar with and then changing and adapting things into that to add to the, the, the skill set and the mindset that the kids were going to need when they got to camp. Um, and I guess the, the first bit about the, the game design process is it didn't, again, it didn't matter what the game was like at the end. It was the process of going through these steps. And I don't even think the kids even clicked. It had anything to do with how they were going to be at camp. And we didn't tell them. We, I mean, we talked about them using like information about themselves and things like that to, to add detail to certain parts in the game design process but we never said to them we're doing this so that you're ready for camp because our camp is in term four term four when you're a year six and you're about to leave for intermediate can be really difficult for kids because they're in they're starting to go into like a transition mode so you kind of you've got to keep them kind of actively engaged in that time you can lose them so quickly because they're starting to think well I'm not here for much longer you know I'll be at a new school next year and some of them are really excited about that and others are absolutely petrified so not only does this preparing for camp prepare them for the camp it actually prepares them for that transition as well and so that was something that surprised me that I didn't realize when I was planning it that this wasn't just for camp that this actually extended beyond camp into the weeks afterwards as well and as they went towards um, going to intermediate. Once Leanne and her team had considered the purpose of camp and knew they wanted to use games and game design as a way to teach students the skills they needed for camp and beyond they began mapping out the details of the unit. 
During the pre-camp unit, which runs in the five weeks prior to camp, students participate in a range of individual and group learning activities that centre around students designing their own role play based games. Here Leanne shares some of these learning tasks. So one of them was uh, we didn't tell them or show them where the camp was or what it looked like. Uh, we gave them a list of things about the camp and they had to draw their own map based on the information we gave them. So we'd say things like the tents are next to the main lodge building. There is a swing bridge to get to the flying fox. And so they had to take all of these instructions and they worked in groups to come up with some ideas around what their maps would look like. And they made these maps. And if things weren't quite where they were, it was we'd just go back and we'd ask some questions. So it was a real reading task because it was all about working out what these instructions meant. From there, we used that map to become their game board. And the next phase was sort of like um, coming up with some scenarios that might happen in the places around the camp. And the scenarios didn't have to be camp specific. They were based on what you might know about camps, but they did. Like we did, we tried to discourage things like aliens arriving from outer <laughs> space. So we had you know trying to get those possums and rats and things like that, mosquitoes. And so we put these scenarios in that might happen in these different places. And then we went through um, a process of looking at best case, worst case scenario. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, like really powerful because we used this when we got into the camp environment. Because if something happened and the kid was worried, we'd say, well, what's the best case scenario? What's the worst case scenario? What do you think might happen? Uh, so we used that when we were in the camp and they, they, they understood exactly what that was and what that meant. To give you an example of that, we, on our very last night of the camp last year, there was a massive storm coming and, uh, and I was told by the person that was on duty that night that we may have to evacuate from the tents and go into the lodge area. Now I could have chosen to keep that information to myself until the moment of crisis where we had to move. <laughs> or I could have told my students and I decided that I'd tell them and do the best case, worst case scenario. And it was great because I put it back on to them to think, well, what is the worst thing that could happen? And that was great because it was a real life situation. What's the best case? And then what kind of what's likely to happen? Um, and we were very lucky. We had a lot of rain, but we didn't, and we could hear the thunder um, in the distance, but it actually kind of missed us. And we didn't have to evacuate and we were out by a uh, quarter to nine ready for spotlight. So, um, it, you know, it was just such a good example of preparing for something, using that strategy in the real situation and everything turning out really well. No kids were anxious. No one was crying. No one was worried. That's yeah. awesome. And it, I mean, just hearing you describe that situation, I can imagine that for those students, there were some really powerful realizations and moments of, oh, yeah, actually... I've got all the tools that I need to manage this situation. And then the, the prior learning, building some really strong foundational skills around the key competencies and around, you know, safety management and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, I think that's such a powerful example of ways that we can better prepare our students, not just for camp, but for other things in life. Yeah, definitely. And one of the other activities we did was building some characters for the game. So obviously in a role-playing game, you play as a character. And we got them to actually design these characters based on their own strengths and weaknesses. So that was another really useful thing for them to see what they were uh, actually, you know, what were their strengths? What do they bring to the situation? What were their weaknesses? And then with the scenarios, we got them to kind of apply some of that to the scenarios as well. So, for example, let's say one of the scenarios is somebody is, um, is scared of the dark and they're in there. The, um, there's one night that we spend in like bunk rooms and we're in the bunk room and somebody is having a real panic about the fact that it's dark. So you've got the best case, worst case scenario, likely scenario. But then you also have this other layer, which is what would the character do? in that situation? So you've got people that might be in the room that have the strength that they aren't scared of the dark. Or maybe their strength is they've got a really nice calming voice and calming influence on other people. So we tried to like kind of link those as well. 
so that the kids could see, oh, actually, if there will be people that are feeling like this, what could I do? Do I have some strengths that would help in this situation? Or am I better to send one of the other people in the room to do to deal with that? And so what did you see within the students and how they were interacting with each other during camp? You know, did it change their relationships with each other or the way that they worked together or the way that they even perceived themselves? I definitely think there was... Um, especially with the first the first time I did it it was really obvious because I had a class that of 32 that year that um, weren't very cohesive there was a, a lot of kids that needed different things and so it, it, there was a lot of little cliques and people that needed probably a lot of social emotional support and so I did notice that this was really useful for that particular group of kids because they were very supportive of each other and very understanding and they had really great trust in me because I could pull out these tools to use with them when they were feeling unsafe. Nobody got homesick. Mm. I was explaining for it and nobody got homesick. And I was like, why? Why are they not getting homesick? I was like, because they're ready. They're here. They're here in the moment. So I think they're the, just the belief in themselves that they know what strategies to put in place. Obviously, part of the, the strategies before camp include things like what do you do if you're absolutely having a panic about something and how do you calm your body down? So we do, you know, we look at things like mindfulness and things like that. That, you know, that's really useful if you're trying to get to sleep at camp and you need to calm your, your body and your central nervous system down. But hey, you can use this again you can use this when you're starting to get worried about intermediate or when you're thinking about something for next year. So I think that's that's definitely one that was used straight away. I think going back and referring to things that they did at camp where they showed certain dispositions is another way to sort of highlight to a student what, what strengths they have and things that they might take forward with them. Um, seeing that, look at all those challenges that you did you know, anything from now on might actually seem a lot easier than maybe if you hadn't have take, taken on those challenges. So a lot of it is, I guess, character building. And I think just going and leaving us knowing that they have skills and that they know that they've got the right mindset, I think that gives them the confidence that they can take on that challenge. We've talked about the outcomes of those activities that you did prior camp. But what about in terms of other links to the curriculum? Were there any other kind of ways that you made connections there or were you um, are trying to achieve anything else through those activities? The thing I like about game design is it really does draw on lots of different parts of the curriculum. And, the, you know, obviously there was some really good literacy involved in the tasks. There was, you know, reading and writing were, were included in that. Um, obviously we're pulling in from the health curriculum mm -hmm. as well we did also do some team building things pull them from the PE curriculum beforehand as well like rather than do those at camp let's do those before camp and get, mm -hmm. and get our team ready yeah and um, I think we the nice thing is that we it almost gives us permission to break down the silos of the curriculum and you can add anything that you want with a game design process uh, it doesn't have to be thought of as just an inquiry I mean, you can add maths in there. I mean, the kids having to roll up their little boards with the squares on them, they, they had to basically make grids to use for their game boards. You know, that for some of them was really like quite difficult. Yeah, you can pull whatever you need into it. And I think the New Zealand curriculum gives you the freedom to do that. Um, and so what recommendations do you have for people that are really keen to jump in and have a go? You had a question that was your starting point, but what what would be some ways that people could kind of start making some moves into that space? I think if you view it as a process rather than an outcome, I think you can you can really design a range of activities, whether they build on each other or are part of a longer process or whether they sort of sit independently. I think it's thinking if you if you actually yeah use the key competencies as your driver, what types of things might kids need and then design activities around that so um yeah it doesn't have to be so literacy focused or so maths focused or so inquiry focused 
you you do have to just sort of get in there and get kids collaborating together and working together. That's the whole that's the whole kind of thing that glues it all together is just them actually having to work in groups. By the way, we did random groups for you every time. So <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and I think just yeah, doing it doing something which um, people have to work together to, in order to achieve is a really great starting point. Adding some other different dimensions to that, you can do so much great stuff. You can do anything. I mean, it's I think people think they're restricted mm-hmm. by things, but actually, if you sort of open it up and go, "Wow, let's try this or let's try that," I think you'd be quite pleasantly surprised at what might happen. I'm keen to just get an understanding of how your wider school community responded to the changes because I know that for some schools camp is quite a traditional place in the school and it's been done a particular way for a long time and so I mean you've made some changes to your at camp program but what was the response from teachers and parents and students to the change that you made leading up to camp? So I guess for the students they only knew if they had older siblings that had been at the school so they didn't have any um, preconceptions of what camp was going to be like Mm -hmm. so they were quite they've all been every year we've done it they've been quite open and you know excited because it's something new and also they love saying oh my older brother didn't get to do this um that's been very positive with the teachers that have either had the chance to visit or have a look they've been really excited as well at being at a different camp and seeing that these kids can do amazing things for our parents when parents picked their kids up from that first camp, they were absolutely gobsmacked at what their kids had actually done in that time. They couldn't believe. Parents saw their kids differently because of what they were able to achieve. Yeah, I think um, that the power of student voice, you know, you can just see the proof is in the pudding when, you know, these kids explain their experiences. I just think that sometimes we underestimate the power of that to transform other people's thinking. And so in terms of resources, or or I'm not sure whether you can think of this off the top of your head, but are there any good resources or articles or tools that people could use to unpack this process? Because you've kind of talked about the game design process a little bit, and obviously we haven't been able to cover that in here, but yeah, we actually, um, so myself and Rachel Bolstead from NZCR and Diana Grace and Dan Millwood from uh, Game Fruit. Actually, we came up with a, we've made it free for people to look at. It's on the Gameful Praxis website, gamefulpraxis.com. And it's actually a, a slideshow presentation of what the game design process is. So that's available for people to use. We also came up with a resource which looks at game mechanics. So we basically, if you were to unpack a game, like what is actually, what makes it a game? Mm -hmm. And that's also really helpful to use to get kids to think about what their game might need. And we've made that all free on Creative Commons. That's great. I'm sure lots of people will be really keen to check that out. Um, Well, thank you so much, Leanne. That's just been gold. And I know that lots of people will find that really interesting. It's great to see such innovative practice. And I have no doubt that your students will just be so grateful to have you leading them in that base. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you. Well, if you're anything like me, you've come away from this case study feeling inspired and with a head full of questions and ideas. I particularly love the way Leanne has encouraged us to reframe our thinking from camp as a one-off learning experience to an engaging and integrated unit of learning that really enables our students to maximise their camp experience. I highly recommend checking out the resources that Leanne shared with us. You can find links to these in the Churton Park School case study write-up which you can find on the EONS website. Here you'll also be able to find further information about the Revisioning School Camps PLD and have access to additional case studies and resources. Thanks again for joining us. Until next time, mā te wā.